Hello everyone and a warm uh, good morning to all the distinguished doctors. Uh, good afternoon from India side, good, uh, good morning in Ghana. I am Dr. Shishikan from the Medical Affairs team of MSN Labs. Today we are here for a medical webinar on current antiplatelet therapy and role of ticagrelar in the management of ACS. We are joined by renowned cardiologists from Ghana and India to share their valuable knowledge and experiences. It is my honor to welcome the moderator for the session, Dr. Alfred Doku. Dr. Alfred Doku is a senior consultant, physician and cardiologist. He is head of cardiology at University of Ghana Medical School and University of Ghana Purlebu Teaching Hospital. He is also the immediate president, Ghanaian Society of Cardiology and fellow of German Cardiac Society and also West African College of Physicians. As the secretary of Ghana Society of Hypertension and Cardiology, and as project director for Ghana Heart Initiatives, Dr. Alfred has led many initiatives for prevention, detection, and management of cardiovascular diseases in Ghana. He is a noted public health champion advocated, advocating current management practices of cardiovascular diseases. Welcome, Dr. Alfred. Thank you very much. Privilege. Thank you. Yeah. It is also my privilege, sir, to welcome the speaker for the session, Dr. C. Raghu. Dr. Raghu is a highly respected heart specialist and one of the best cardiologists in Hyderabad, India. He is an MD General Medicine from the world famous Ames in Delhi and an EDM Cardiology from prestigious NIMS Hospital in Hyderabad. He also he studied International Cardiology Fellowship from uh, Institute Cardiovascular in Paris and also a master's course in Structural Heart Interventions from St. Anna University in Italy. He, Dr. Raghu specializes in International Cardiology Positions procedures and is a pioneer in transradial and complex coronary angioplasty strand procedures. Over the last two, two decades, with more than 25 years of experience, he has performed more than 40,000 coronary diagnostic procedures and 20,000 coronary intervention procedures. He's, Dr. Raghu is known for his expertise in treating wide range of cardiovascular conditions, including coronary artery disease, heart failure, varicose veins, and valvular heart disease. Welcome, Dr. Raghu. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Shishita. Yeah. Today, we are also joined by Mr. Rajan Kotari, General Manager Marketing uh, for Emerging Markets and MSN Labs. So, I request Dr. Rajan to please start the proceedings from his end. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sashi. So, welcome to my team uh, in India. Thank you, Dr. Raghu. Thank you very much uh, for accepting our uh, invitation. And also, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Alfred, I met you personally, so thank you once again, uh, you know, to accept our invitation as a moderator. So I will start with the uh, corporate uh, presentation uh, and I will be taking you through the uh, MSN uh, uh, corporate uh, presentation. So first and foremost, uh, uh, we are basically headquartered in Hyderabad. Uh, that's our global corporate headquarters. Uh, our company was founded in 2003 by Dr. MSN and uh, we are engaged in uh, developing world-class APIs and finished products and we have a global distinction of delivering products that epitomizes quality, safety and affordability. Our vision and mission, our vision is to emerge as a globally renowned uh, pharmaceutical company and offer affordable medicines to all our patients globally and also in Ghana. And also our mission is to leverage our research and development capabilities to bring affordable medicines and generic swiftly and consistently. If you look at our organization at a glance, we have 20 years of presence. So we are actually celebrating almost uh, 20 years and we are present in more than 80 countries. We have more than 450 APIs. 21 state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities, out of which 20 are in Hyderabad and one is in New Jersey, which is America. We have 300 plus formulations. We are world's number one in active US DMF filings and uh, our revenue is around uh, 750 million US dollar and we are marching towards 1 billion US dollar uh, next year in terms of our revenue. We have more than 14,000 employees uh, worldwide. And we have been growing almost at a CAGR of 35%. Our focus and our core strength has been 
APIs, finished dosages, branded generics, and CDMS, which is contract development and manufacturing services. We have best in class APIs across multiple therapeutic areas. We have proven expertise in organic synthesis, carbohydrates, achiral chemistry, metal chemistry, complex peptides, iron complexes, and polymer chemistry. And also we have proven expertise in manufacturing prostaglandins and peptides and high potency APIs. Formulation, uh, we have 300 plus strong and robust portfolio in our pipeline. Uh, we have nanotechnology in our oncology products. We have presence in ophthalmology. That's our new therapy area. We are going to enter soon. And we also have biosimilars in the pipeline. Among the solid oral forms, we have intermittent release, extended release, sustained release, modified release, to name a few. And in our capabilities for liquids, we have oral suspensions, solutions, syrups, drops, emulsions, and mixtures. We also have very strong parental capabilities in the form of ampules, vials, uh, depot injections, and auto injectors. We provide global access to all our affordable generics, and we have strong presence not only globally, we have also a strong presence even in India with our top five uh, selling brands. And we are increasing our footprint and market share across the emerging markets like LATAM, Asia, Africa, MENA, uh, CIS, to name a few countries. And we are trusted by 40 million patients worldwide. We also play a very strong role in catalyzing the partner's growth because we are one-stop shop right from vertical integration right from APIs to intermediates to formulation, we are a one-stop uh, shop and we have very strong experience R&D team. We have more than 1500 uh, scientists working day in and day out to develop the non-infringement products. We have strong manufacturing capacities right from small to large scales API as well as FDF. We follow all the regulatory compliances and we also have dedicated capacities to manufacture capsules, tablets, injections, syrups, etc. We have extremely strong financial stability and we have a record of delivering quality products always on time. In terms of our manufacturing uh, excellence, we have uh, 15 API plants and six finished dosage formulation plants, which are state of the art and fully integrated facilities, which are fully compliant with uh, current good manufacturing practices. We constantly upgrade our processes, technologies and equipments, and we are audited by the most stringent regulatory bodies of the world. We have very strong FDF capacities in the form of manufacturing tablets. We have a capacity to manufacture approximately 12 billion tablets, 2 billion capsules, 100 million sachets, 7 million oral suspensions, and 100 tons of granules. Our facility have renowned accreditation globally. We are accredited by all the leading regulatory bodies worldwide, whether it is UKMHRA, uh, Envisa Brazil, Envima Colombia, uh, uh, the, uh, the Kenyan body, the Zimbabwe, Yemen, Jordan, Qatar, UAE, Saudi, Australian, Uganda, Namibia, Ghana, and also WHO, Geneva. In terms of research and development, we have one of the Asia's largest integrated R&D center, which allows us API and finished dosage formulation research under one roof. We have 2,200 top-notch experts dedicated to our R&D, and we have proven capability in niche generics, complex and difficult to make APIs, formulation, new chemical entities, and novel drug delivery systems. In terms of our research credentials, we have 50 state-of-the-art laboratories, we have applied for almost 900 patents for national and international application, out of which 150 have been granted. And we have more than 1,000 global DMFs. And uh, as mentioned earlier, we are the world's largest uh, DMF filing company. In fact, we are world's number one DMF filing companies among Indian companies. 
we have almost filed 8000 plus dossiers dossiers out of which 2400 are already approved and we have many first to file dossiers approximately 50 plus and we have almost 160 abbreviated new de drug development uh, dossiers which also we have filed and all our dossiers are approved by usfda and certified these are our country wise uh, drug master files uh, so highest is in uh, us which is almost around 455 let us have a look at our uh, global uh, footprint our corporate headquarter is based in hyderabad uh, we also have our uh, regional offices uh, starting from the east side which is uh, philippines uh, in uh, malaysia in uh, vietnam and uh, we have also very strong regional office in mina which is uae coming to africa africa our regional office is in kenya uh, we also have our uh, subsidiaries and warehouse in uh, czech republic which is vivanta in uh, uk and also our regional office subsidiary is in malta coming to latam uh, we have our subsidiary in brazil mexico chile colombia peru so these are the countries where we have uh, strong presence in the latam region and we also have our plant in new jersey which is usa also which our office is also there in usa coming to north america uh, we have state of the art finished dosage facility based in new jersey and the facility is capable to produce high quality so solid oral liquids and powders including pellets as well as uh, granules and novadose is our sub sales and marketing subsidiary and currently we are manufacturing oral solids tablets capsules and injectable including oncology as well as specialty products when it comes to europe we established our office in europe in 2018 it's headquartered in uk and we also have offices in czech republic and malta we have more than 40 plus dossiers uh, filed uh, in europe and 50 more are in uh, pipeline and we have over 700 uh, ms which are our majority of the customers to whom we supply now coming to the emerging markets we have operation in more than 70 plus uh, countries we have a strong partnership with more than 34 plus global partners we have 30 plus national regulatory approvals and uh, we have 124 plus self marketed products our revenue in emerging market is around 80 plus very soon we are headed towards 100 million dollar revenue in emerging market and uh, we have presence uh, in lot of countries across the continent Uh, for africa we are present in more than 22 countries and key therapies are cardiology oncology diabetes cns orthopedics gastroenterology nephrology urology and otc these are some of our uh, emerging markets uh, top brands uh, we have uh, cardiovascular products among cardiovascular products we have uh, atorem which is atorvastatin apnon which is aplerinone uh, eldenil which is our rosuvastatin uh, safe tell me which is our tell me satin so these are our top brands for emerging market and if we look at a cvs portfolio we have extremely strong uh, cvs portfolio of uh, anti hypertension of pulmonary arterial hypertension statins heart failure and also the anti coagulants so across we cover end to end wide therapeutic portfolio for the entire cardiovascular range. range we also have a strong presence in india we have more than 1100 field force which cover almost 90000 medical professionals and we are also rank among the top 10 trusted trusted brands as per the iqia data these are some of the brands which we uh, market and uh, market and sell in india coming to the global footprint uh, we have 1400 uh, quality experts and we have high quality standards at each and every step right from procurement to the final product and uh, most importantly uh, delegates we have record of seven back to back successful us fda audits with zero observations and we are recognized for one quality standard globally 
our therapeutic offerings we have a wide presence in 35 plus therapeutic categories and we are planning to expand into more categories so cbs cns oncology respiratory gastro nephro uro ortho anti inflammatory diabetes immunology hematology and dermatology we are preferred partner for many innovators uh, and uh, world's leading generic companies and global procurement bodies and uh, what makes us the preferred partner we have a robust manufacturing infrastructure we have backward integration capabilities we have respect for international patent rights and we have also partnered with uh, medicines patent pool to launch msd's uh, molnupiravir as well as in license pfizer's products paxlovid these are some of our partners so our partners are the domestic partners and also we have our international pa partners to name a few and we have also strong association with the clinton foundation as also well as with the world health organization we also care for the environment uh, we make a meaningful difference to both our planet as well as uh, communities we have zero discharge uh, facilities and we provide 50% green cover at all our manufacturing sites and we are also looking for solar power for a sustainable future we also care a lot for our community we do a lot of preventive health checkup camps health and patient awareness initiatives and also we distribute free health kits and medicines across uh, india and also across the world and uh, we are also focusing on our uh, rural infrastructure as well as we provide compassionate medicine programs for our communities our people are our strength in msn we have people first approach we have a motivated team of 14000 employees which are our greatest strength and we create a environment where innovation is encouraged talents are nurtured and growth is ensured we have won lot of awards and uh, accolades uh, whether it is the outstanding export award in 2010 or the the latest one which we received was the pharmaxel patent award in 2021 so we have been receiving consistently award for the last 20 years so this is our global headquarter uh, that's our corporate office at hyderabad thank you thank you mr rajan for the corporate presentation i request uh, dr raghu to please uh, start his session moderator raneeti or we are doing a q and a we have okay uh, thank you uh, colleagues from ghana and uh, professor alfred for this opportunity to share this uh, presentation on uh, tecagrelor uh, and uh, is right yes he has to disconnect yeah okay so uh, today uh, i would be presenting on yeah yeah it's being done yeah okay can we start is it seen there am um, i have my question it's not it's stop you please escape stop it okay can you please get from the macbook is already is already connected here but it was coming just a moment ago presentation is not there just yeah wait a moment just it's a chilling that is good okay yeah good it is coming okay 
move to display. Just open up CMD PD. Put us see. Yeah, okay. Okay, sorry about it. Yeah. So, uh, Professor Alfred and uh, my colleagues from Ghana, it would be my uh, privilege to share with you the current uh, antiplatelet therapy and the role of Tecaprolor in acute coronary syndrome. Um, it is a good uh, thing to know that uh, MSN is launching Tecaprolor in Ghana and uh, it would not be inappropriate for me uh, to share my experience with uh, Tecaprolor over the last 12 years uh, in this uh, in India. And uh, I had to change from clopidogrel to Tecaprolor because of a a few patients of mine in, way back in 2011, where we had a, I had a crop of uh, stent thrombosis. So I was looking at some other better antiplatelet agent. And at that time, Ticagrelor was launched in the country. And over the last 12 years, I had been using Ticagrelor. And um, I had a lot of uh, practical uh, knowledge about the use of this molecule, which we can discuss in our Q&A session. So now let me uh, let me uh, give you a broad outlook of the acute coronary syndrome, which is a very common problem across the world. I'm sure in Ghana also acute coronary syndrome is a major problem. And as we all know, acute coronary syndrome encompasses the three different entities of ST elevation myocardial infarction, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and unstable angina. The problem with this acute coronary syndrome is about 15%, that means one in every six patients with acute coronary syndrome do not survive the event. So it, it still uh, has got a lot of mortality. So the goals of the treatment of acute coronary syndrome are number one, the relief of pain, and number two is the reduction of complications. So uh, the reduction of complications are predominantly recurrence of myocardial infarction and mortality. So our endeavor as physicians is to reduce these two complications. How do we treat acute coronary syndrome in 2023? It is by good antiplatelet therapy and timely revascularization. That is the principal treatment strategy. Gone are the days when we were using nitroglycerines and all those things. Right now, we do a good uh, timely revascularization and choose right antiplatelet therapy so that we have a lower chances of death and recurrent myocardial infarction. Uh, over the last decade, there were a lot of advances in the uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. And uh, in 2016, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association have given a focused guidelines on dual antiplatelet therapy or in short the DAP. The European Society of Cardiology has given a focused update in 2017. So following this in 2020, uh, there were some uh, noted uh, small mini update type of a thing which has happened from the European Society of Cardiology which we will discuss subsequently. Now, let us understand that the management of um, um, the, the management or the use of dual antiplatelet agents, aspirin loading dose of 160 to 325 milligrams and maintenance dose of 81 milligrams indefinitely. The second antiplatelet agent, long ago we were using uh, Tyclopidine, but those those are gone now. So nowadays we use a P2Y12 inhibitor. Uh, uh, we have got 
two agents that is the clopidogrel prasugrel and ticagrelor three agents sorry for at least which we use for at least three months so for acute coronary syndrome patients we give aspirin loading of 325 mg or 162 and give maintenance of up to 100 mg indefinitely there is second antiplatelet agent we give for 12 months for the last 5 years there are a lot of advances in the dual antiplatelet therapy we have got new antiplatelet regimens uh, from the days when we used to think aspirin is the main drug we have got new antiplatelet regimens of aspirin free antiplatelet regimen so from a, uh, from the time when we used to think that aspirin has to be given for all the patients we are moving towards a regimen of aspirin free regimens and we have alternate durations that means uh, even though the class 1 recommendation of at least 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy we want to reduce the du duration of the dual antiplatelet therapy so today we are going to discuss in which scenarios we can move on to an abbreviated dual antiplatelet therapy in which scenarios we can go for a aspirin free strategies and which agents out of these p2y12 which we can use for a aspirin free strategy we used to think that the manage the the, the pathogenesis of atherosclerotic acute coronary syndrome used to be a ruptured plaque but we we now understand with the newer imaging modalities like the optical coherence tomography that plaque rupture uh, and exposure of the uh, large lipid pool beneath you can see in the first uh, um, topmost uh, cartoon topmost part of the cartoon that there is a large lipid pool which gets exposed and it gets thrombosed uh, that is the reason for the thrombosis so that was what we used to uh, think is the major predominant mechanism but it is present in only about 65 to 70% of the cases we realize that plaque erosion uh, or a superficial plaque erosion is responsible for about 20 to 30% of the cases so in the plaque rupture the lipid pool is exposed whereas in the plaque erosion we have a denudation of the endothelium and exposure of the subendothelial proteoglycan area so you got plaque erosion and plaque rupture are the predominant mechanisms for the thrombus formation in addition for people who have got a long standing fibrous plaque this group of patients they present mostly with calcified vessels and this is a presenting as a chronic stable angina so for acute coronary syndrome we have plaque rupture and plaque erosion are the mechanisms for uh, um, for the presence of for the for the presentation of the clinical presentation nowadays we realize that beyond plaque rupture and plaque erosion responsible for thrombosis there are a lot of clinical scenarios like we have a spontaneous dissection for example plaque rupture and thrombosis is the commonest cause of thrombus formation in males whereas plaque erosion is more common in women similarly spontaneous coronary artery dissection is also another common reason for uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome presentation in women in addition we have got some other uh, et some other pathogenic mechanisms like coronary spasm myocardial bridging arteritis and also myocardial infarction with non obstructed coronary artery disease or in short minoca so the acute coronary syndrome what we used to have uh, what we used to have the unstable angina non stemi and stemi we have now newer entities uh, like uh, what we already know is the prince battle angina or the coronary spasm but we have a new entity of the minoca uh, which has come up in the guidelines in the last 5 years so uh, we have different pathogenic mechanisms we understand the pathogens is much better so when we understand the pathogens is much better we can personalize our therapies for that particular patient now let us look at this uh, picture uh, of how the platelets get activated and aggregated 
So there are two uh, mechanisms. One is the arachidonic acid pathway. And the second is the ADP mediated pathway. So the arachidonic acid pathway is predominantly affected by the cyclooxygenase enzyme. So aspirin, our standard antiplatelet agent, as we all remember, inhibits the cyclooxygenase and reduces the thromboxane synthesis and thus reduces the platelet aggregation, yeah, aggregation and activation. So aspirin acts on the cyclooxygenase pathway. Whereas our P2 Y12 inhibitors, uh, the oral P2 Y12 inhibitors are clopidogrel, prosugrel, and ticagrel are in the way how they have been come into the market and invented. So they act on the ADP. And these P2 Y12 inhibitors, they inhibit um, this, uh, they act on the ADP pathway and they inhibit the P2 Y12 receptor blockade and they cause either reversible or irreversible in activation of the platelet, inhibition of the platelet activation. So this is the other group. In the past, we used to use one more receptor blocker that is a glycoprotein 2B3A receptor blocker like Epsiximab, Eptifibotide and Tyrofibar. So those we used to use a lot in the past, but nowadays we realized and as we understood better, we, we understood that the inhibition of P2Y12 receptors is the key for inhibition of the platelets. Then we have one more group of inhibition that is the PAR1 inhibitor, PAR1 receptor, that is the platelet, protease activated receptor 1 blocker. So this molecule is the Warapaxer. So now in front of you, we have four different groups of agents. Aspirin, P2Y12 inhibitors, glycoprotein 2B3A blockers, and we have the PAR1 inhibitors. Of all these groups of molecules, as we realize, the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor blockers, even though they have been introduced with a lot of fanfare, they slowly had to be going out of the market. Warapaxar, the benefit is limited, as we will understand later. It also went out of the market. That leaves us with aspirin and P2Y12 inhibitors. And we realize that aspirin, even though uh, it has been in use for so many years, we realize that we need a much more potent agent with less bleeding. That is where the we have to position and rely upon the P2Y12 inhibition as the main pathway for antiplatelet agents. Our understanding of um, of acute coronary syndrome and platelet inhibition uh, has uh, we we started understanding that the predominant mechanism of uh, plate uh, of acute coronary syndrome is mediated through platelets. That is the reason why our predominant drug of treatment in acute coronary syndrome is a antiplatelet. Even today, when we do after angioplasty, our, we totally uh, trust our antiplatelet, uh, that is uh, DAPT therapy. In the past, we used to give a lot of thrombolytic agents, but now we realize that only for ST elevation myocardial infarction, the two who present quite early during the acute myocardial infarction, thrombolytic therapy has got an effective role because the reason for the thrombosis in acute coronary syndrome is a platelet-rich thrombus rather than a red thrombus, which is a fibrin-rich thrombus. So our emphasis is more on antiplatelet agents and that too on the P2Y12 inhibitors. Now let's go on to the, uh, the second group that is, let's say our patient, uh, one of our patients had an acute myocardial infarction or an unstable angina, he undergoes an angioplasty. So whenever we perform a balloon dilatation, we all know that this, that will disrupt the endothelium and expose the subendothelial collagen. This was what we were looking at in the plaque erosion also. In plaque erosion also, the endothelium gets denuded and our and the subendothelial collagen gets exposed. So this balloon angioplasty has got two ways. One is because the endothelium is denuded, it activates the inflammation. It is pro-inflammatory, which activates the platelet and causes the stent thrombosis. Similarly, 
This inflammation also activates the smooth muscle cells and causes an instant restoration over time. So, uh, the, the platelet activation and smooth muscle cell proliferation, those are the reasons for early stent thrombosis or delayed instant restenosis. So, to overcome the problem of instant restenosis, uh, there were drug eluting stents which have been introduced using different drugs, uh, mostly the Limus group of drugs like Sirolimus, Jotrolimus, and Everolimus, and they reduce the smooth cell proliferation and thus reduce the restenosis. But what happens is when it is inhibiting the smooth cell proliferation, it delays the endothelial formation or endothelialization. So a delayed endothelialization leads to a delayed stent thrombosis. That is the reason why we need to give a prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy. So why do we need for one year of dual antiplatelet therapy? It's because the endothelialization is delayed after stenting. That is the reason why we need to give at least one year of DAPT therapy. That is what the ACC and EAC recommend after acute coronary syndrome. But what happened over the last one decade, we have thinner stent strength. That means the thickness of the stent has become much more thinner. They are along with the, to, to keep the drug attached to the stent, there are biocompatible polymers which are used. Those polymers became better and these better polymers and thinner stent strut led to lesser inflammation and lesser rate of stent thrombosis. So that is the reason why now we have new P2 vitral therapies where we give a shortened duration of antiplatelet drug therapy. DAPT duration is abbreviated because we have uh, much better stents and much better polymers um, on the stent surface. So now let's go on to the three uh, important or the two major groups of drugs. One is the aspirin. As we all know, that inhibits the thromboxane A2 synthesis by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase. Aspirin reversibly inhibits the platelets. If you look at long back in 1980s, we had the ISIS-2 trial and they have followed up these patients for just for five weeks and they showed that 23% vascular mortality reduction. Similarly, a large number of small studies have been done with a total patient base of about one, one, 135,000 and which also showed a reduction in mace and non-fatal myocardial infarction. As we already know, the loading dose has to be 162 to 325 milligrams, followed by 81 milligrams daily that has to be given indefinitely. That is what is the recommendation by the guideline committees for aspirin. But when you look at the aspirin trials, you will be surprised to see that there were three trials, one in, in something in the contemporary era, uh, but uh, that was in 2010, but OAS is seven, but that's, the trial is not uh, designed to study only aspirin, but this was one of the arms of the study. So where they had followed up the patient for only one month, ISIS-2 landmark trial, 160 mg of aspirin, not the 81 milligrams, followed up for 1.25 months only. So these trials had been performed on, uh, on for a very short follow-up period, but still because this was one of the initial drugs, these drugs became, the aspirin has become a must therapy for acute coronary syndrome. Now let us look at, compare the all the four or five agents which are available for our practice. One is, uh, first is the aspirin. The second group is the P2 white valutas, that is clopidogrel, prosugrel, and ticagrelor. And you have got the PAR1 receptor inhibitor, that is the Warapaxa. Of all these things, the first four are the thing, four drugs which are quite successful. And if you look at them, um, aspirin and ticagrelor, these are the two agents which are uh, not pro-drugs and they do not need any conversion to become an active drug. So aspirin, you give it, it works directly. Ticagrelor also when you give, it works directly. Whereas clopidogrel and prasugrel are pro-drugs and they need to be converted to the active drug form. The major difference in 
aspirin versus the other agencies the onset of action if we give aspirin it works within 60 minutes if you give clopidogrel it takes at least 2 to 4 hours for the molecule to act whereas if you give prosugrel it acts within 30 to 60 minutes but ticagrel or why it would became successful is it acts within 30 minutes so in a patient with acute coronary syndrome we all know that time is muscle we want the antiplatelet action to uh, come very fast that is why ticagrel or has replaced clopidogrel in my day to day practice because when we want to when we do a angioplasty we want the drug to act immediately that is why we started using ticagrel number 2 is people might say we can give clopidogrel and give a glycoprotein 2 b3 enter but those drugs have been associated with higher bleeding rate so whatever benefit we were getting it is getting lost because of increase in bleeding so ticagrel because of its rapid onset of action has established itself as an important th- therapy in the management of acute coronary syndrome and if you look at them clopidogrel and prosugrel they are irreversible platelet inhibitors whereas ticagrel is a direct acting reversible antagonist that is the mechanism of action so the difference is for example if you have a patient of acute coronary syndrome and he has got a triple vessel disease you want to send the patient for bypass surgery you can stop ticagrel or for 36 hours and send the patient because it is a reversible antagonism and it is a short acting drug compared to clopidogrel and prosugrel where the half life is longer and they are irreversible antagonists of p2 white well so platelet inhibition is irreversible with clopidogrel and prosugrel whereas it is reversible with ticagrel and similarly for aspirin the loading dose is one thing in, uh, which we need to uh, remember because when we use these drugs ticagrel has got a loading dose of 180 mg it usually comes in a strength of 90 mg and for maintenance dose it also comes in a strength of 60 mg but when we load ticagrel we need to give 180 mg the important advantage of ticagrel is rapid onset of action and reversible inhibition short half life but very important is there is no known resistance that means when you give clopidogrel about 20 to 30% of the patients especially smokers have got a resistance to clopidogrel that means even though you give clopidogrel it does not work for them that is the reason why you need a much more potent molecule uh, uh, which does not so that people do not have resistance to this so ticagrel and prosugrel they do not exhibit resistance in contrast the people are known to be non responders to aspirin and clopidogrel we have been using clopidogrel for almost two decades now we know what is the loading dose we have two very large trials of cure and current oasis 7 which showed a combination of aspirin plus clopidogrel is superior to aspirin only and that is where cure trial has first established the role for dual antiplatelet therapy of aspirin plus clopidogrel now other thing was current oasis 7 so what is the dose of clopidogrel what we need to give so that has established that any dose of clopidogrel beyond 75 mg is not going to be helpful to the patient and instead it was causing more bleeding so high dose of clopidogrel has increased bleeding compared to standard dose of clopidogrel that is 75 mg so with the oasis 7 we established that the drug dose of clopidogrel what we need to give is 75 mg now coming on to the second molecule that is prosugrel we already understood that prosugrel has got a rapid onset of action 30 to 60 minutes so after clopidogrel prosugrel was launched into the market so we started using prosugrel in our practice also that was about 15 years ago so when we started using prosugrel based upon the triton timi 38 trial 
we understood that it to compare to clopidogrel prasugrel is a much better molecule in improved cardiovascular outcome but what we understood from prasugrel i still remember the days when we were using prasugrel people were having more of bleeding problems that was very common in people who are less than 70 kg of weight people who are more than 75 years of age and for people who already have experienced a brain stroke they had a higher uh, recurrence of the stroke rate because of brain bleeds so prasugrel even though it was introduced with lot of fanfare in indian market it did not stand the test of time because of its high bleeding complication rate so what we understood is clopidogrel then we went back to clopidogrel during that time about 15 years ago even though prasugrel was launched we realized because of the bleeding we were more apprehensive so of the bleeding complications and went back to uh, clopidogrel about a few years ago 3 4 years ago we had the isa react 5 trial which showed that compared to prasugrel prasugrel versus ticagrelor prasugrel is better but this trial has got a lot of limitations uh, because about 25% of the patients had a crossover into the ticagrelor arm now let us go on to the uh, main drug that is the ticagrelor the difference is clopidogrel and uh, prasugrel are thionopyridine derivatives whereas ticagrelor is a p2 y12 mta but it is a non thionopyridine derivative non thionopyridine it has got a faster onset of action and shorter half life so clopidogrel we can give once a day whereas ticagrelor because of its short half life we have to give twice a day if you ask me that is the uh, important uh, thing what we need to remember when we instruct our patient they should not miss the second dose especially when we do a complex tenting but over the last 12 10 12 years i never had patients who skipped the doses in the evening they are complained with the twice a day dosing of ticagrelor one of the major issues what when we give ticagrelor we need to understand that these patients who are on ticagrelor experience non exertional dyspnea so you start the patient on ticagrelor patient complain of dyspnea sometimes they feel very much disabled but please understand that this is a very benign problem and once we reassure the patient and continue the ticagrelor therapy the dyspnea gets better within one week of treatment and a very minute percentage that is less than 5% of my patients had to be withdrawn if you ask me over the last 3 to 4 years i never needed to withdraw the ticagrelor save for one or two patients in a year so ticagrelor the patient do complain of non exertional dyspnea just you need to reassure them when i started using ticagrelor uh, i was very much what is this breathlessness is it due to stent problem is it due to recurrence of myocardial infarction but later on i understood that this is a, this is a ticagrelor side effect and that is due to the adenosine receptor activation just like what you have in the bronchial asthma uh so it is mediated through the adenosine we have got two large trials with uh, ticagrelor one is the plato the second is the pegasus tme54 they study uh, uh in different subsets of patient plato is for acute coronary syndrome pegasus tme54 for a chronic therapy so with the plato trial it has been established that compared to clopidogrel in the standard dose ticagrelor at a 90 mg twice a day had a very good outcomes on the pegasus tb54 it has been shown that continuation of uh, ticagrelor um, um, as a more, as a mono therapy also it has got a dose of 90 mg twice a day even for chronic coronary artery disease it has been found to be useful now let's look at the plato trial in little detail it shows that compared to clopidogrel ticagrelor has got a much better reduction of the primary event rate one thing which is worth mentioning whenever we are giving ticagrelor is in this plato trial they tried low dose of aspirin and a higher dose of aspirin that is higher dose means more than 100 mg 
and low dose means less than 100 mg of aspirin it is very important to know that people if you see the combination of low dose aspirin and ticagrelor showed the best possible outcome that is why us fda has told that whenever patients who are on as ticagrelor they should receive a low dose aspirin this is very important because i remember one of my patients was um, and uh, when i started uh, ticagrelor i was giving uh, 150 mg of aspirin at that time but with the uh, when we started using ticagrelor one of my patients alerted me that we need to give a low dose of aspirin so we need to understand that ticagrelor we have to use a low dose of aspirin that was way back in 2012 so uh, that is what i wanted to tell you on the role of ticagrelor now compared to prosugril versus ticagrelor uh, prosugril is only for patients who are going for angioplasty not for acute coronary syndrome patients for medical management so prosugril role is only for pci patients for medically managed patients ticagrelor can be used ticagrelor can be used both for medically managed acute coronary syndrome as well as for those who undergo angioplasty in stent so that is the difference between ticagrelor and prosugril now orapexer is not has been introduced uh, has been tried in couple of trials but it was not so successful so i am not going to go into the study now coming on to the recent advances under duration of dual antiplatelet therapy nowadays when we give dual antiplatelet therapy we have got indication for acute coronary syndrome and chronic coronary syndrome going for uh, angioplasty for patient with acute coronary syndrome uh, if um, um, the the recommendation is for 12 months of dapt but for chronic coronary syndrome we can try an abbreviated dap therapy so that we can decide by using objective scoring systems so at the time of coronary stenting what we use is the precise dap score if the precise dap score is more than 25 then we give a 3 to 6 months of dap whereas if the score is less than 25 then we give a long dap so for patients whom we uh, who are going for coronary stenting we use a precise dap score you have got a uh, calculator online very easy to use based on that we can determine whether the patient needs a long term antiplatelet or a short term antiplatelet now after one year as per the acc and esc guidelines we have to we can stop dapt and go on to single antiplatelet therapy but if we see patients lot of our patient tend to have events after one year because uh, even after one year also patient tend to have event and we want to effectively prevent a second myocardial infarction or an unstable angina so sometimes we give a longer duration of dual antiplatelet therapy so to determine whether my patient will benefit from a prolonged dapt that is after one year we can determine by using the dap score so for that dap score also we have a calculator so dap score we use after the end of one year precise dap at the time of angioplasty to determine the duration so from a time from a uh, uh, from a less objective way we are from a more subjective way we are moving towards a precise objective way of determining how long we have to give dual antiplatelet drug therapy now we have certain markers in our in a busy practice sometimes you cannot calculate the score so we have to see for example a patient who has got a bleeding on dap or oral anticoagulant people who are more than 65 years of age body weight less than 60 kg diabetes people who have got chronic kidney disease these are the group of patients who have got higher bleeding risk with dapt so people who have the, any of these characteristics we should give a shorter duration of dap instead of a longer duration of the dap 
For patients with acute coronary syndrome, we should give for 12 months of uh, DAP. But beyond 12 months, we used to use the DAP score. And for certain conditions, uh, like chronic stable angina, you can give a shorter duration of DAPT. Now, the next advance is, so we have moved from a DAPT of aspirin clopidogrel to aspirin ticagrelor to a uh, finding people who need a longer antiplatelet agent with a lesser dose of ticagrelor. Now, we have moved a step further, that is the aspirin-free strategies, that is only P2Y12 inhibitors. So, the first trial was the stop DAP trial. We studied only clopidogrel uh, compared to aspirin plus clopidogrel, only clopidogrel after 12 months. And it is a uh, short-term DAP with clopidogrel alone. But the major success, what we had was with the Twilight trial. In this Twilight trial, what they studied is ticagrelor at 90 mg twice a day has been shown to have a much less bleeding event without any difference in the major adverse cardiovascular event. So, ticagrelor plus aspirin versus ticagrelor alone, ticagrelor fared much better. So, we are moving from a aspirin plus ticagrelor to a ticagrelor monotherapy era. Then, after the twilight trial, the, uh, there is one more study which had shown that for a 15-month uh, uh, follow-up study, people who have been given ticagrelor alone, this was a study which was published last year, showed that ticagrelor 90 mg alone in about 1,000 patients each, uh, that has shown to be a much better because of reduced bleeding events, but similar uh, secondary outcomes. So, reduced, moving from aspirin plus ticagrelor to ticagrelor alone in high risk patients. This is not post, um, the, 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 um, the disease for patients who are chronic coronary syndrome. Ticagrelor alone has been shown to be superior compared to a DAP therapy. Finally, there was one more trial which was published last year, that is the TICO trial. The TICO trial also showed that monotherapy had only 1.7% bleeding risk compared to 3% with the dual antiplatelet of aspirin plus ticagrelor. So we started moving from a not only an abbreviated dual antiplatelet drug therapy, we want to reduce the bleeding by giving an effective antiplatelet agent, but with reduced bleeding complication. That is where the role of ticagrelor comes. So P2Y12 monotherapy is the current uh, in thing. And that is why 2020, ESA has given a special amendment to its 2017 guidelines. That means within two to three years after its previous guidelines, European Society of Cardiology said that aspirin plus ticagrelor for three months, followed by ticagrelor monotherapy for non stemi PCI at low bleeding risk. So this is uh, the uh, for, for select patients, you can give ticagrelor monotherapy beyond three months. That is one of the major advances in the DAPT therapy. If you look at, we want an effective antiplatelet regimen, but at the same time, we want a safe antiplatelet regimen. That is where our ticagrelor monotherapy comes. Sometimes in India and uh, in the Western countries, a lot of complex PCA is done. Do we have an effective antiplatelet regimen that has not been studied, but still, even for that group also, Ticagrelor monotherapy has been found to be useful. Now, who are the patients who are not responsive to our routine clopidogrel? That means they are young people, do not respond well to aspirin and clopidogrel. People with high body mass index and concurrent use of NSAIDs, these are the group of patients who have got resistance to the antiplatelet. Uh, agents. Unfortunately, we do not have a way to test whether the patient is going to respond to, uh, is resistant to clopidogrel or aspirin. 
so uh, the, the genetic testing is not found to be useful and it is not recommended that is where once again if you suspect a person has got resistance preferable to go on to take a lot because you have a predicted response now for those patients who have got beyond 12 months who which patient you can decide based upon the dap score whether we patient requires beyond 12 months but in the clinic we can see people who have got diabetes people who have got multiple acute coronary syndrome episodes heart failure renal failure those are the group of patients whom we want to give a prolonged dap therapy so we have to identify which patients require a prolonged dap therapy which patients can benefit from an abbreviated dap followed by a ticagrelor monotherapy so that will help us to treat patients better now in our routine practice the general practitioners ask us some questions like whether we can give concomitant aspirin plus nsaids concurrent use of nsaids and aspirin reduces the efficiency of aspirin that is why if you are giving nsaids plus aspirin you need to understand that aspirin might not work effectively that is the first question the second thing is is it safe to stop antiplatelets before surgery in a patient with acute coronary syndrome it is important to continue one antiplatelet agent p2 y12 inhibitors are very strong antiplatelets so they have got a little higher bleeding complex tendency that is the reason why p2 y12 i stop in my practice and continue to give aspirin for those patients who require surgery it is not advisable to stop both the p2 y12 and aspirin before surgery at least for the first 6 to 12 months after that possibly majority of the physician they can stop p2 y12 for about 5 days uh, uh, for example if you want to stop uh, antiplatelet agents uh, it is enough for you to stop uh, ticagrelor for 3 days clopidogrel for 5 days aspirin for 7 days for the antiplatelet effect to go off 3 5 7 that is a mnemonic one needs to remember when you send this patient for surgery then finally uh, for patients with high bleeding risk we already discussed previously advanced age low body weight diabetes prior bleeding risk we can objectivize this by calculating the hasblet score or the dap score to identify which patients can bleed who require longer antiplatelet we already discussed diabetes heart failure renal failure multiple stents for multiple prior acs episode they need a longer duration of dap therapy with this professor alfred and his colleagues thank you for your attention we can discuss something about which patients require because this is a molecule which is being introduced new into the market there thank you very much my dear friends okay thank you thank very you much very thank you very much uh Arjun, uh, interventional cardiologist, for the eloquent uh, presentation. Um, I think I want to recognize the presence of two of my colleagues, uh, senior colleagues, uh, Professor Inkum and Dr. Uh, Francis Ejukun, um, who are also on the call. Um, let me just make a short uh, comment. make a short comment um that yes cardiovascular disease is a major cause of death uh, in africa in sub saharan africa now and then the the main driver of death um especially on control hypertension but atherosclerotic based cardiovascular disease is really increasing here in ghana and in across africa and uh, we have a lot of patient coming in with some um, ischemic stroke with uh, acute coronary syndrome the number of cath labs um have increased um 2016 2017 we have only one cath lab in Ghana but now we can count about six different cath labs that are uh, operational most of them in 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 Accra uh, so there's a lot of activity i think the only inhibition or the only thing that is preventing a lot of um, volumes here in Africa and Ghana is cost you know so 
most people have to pay out of pocket. Uh, but yeah, a few um, are able to generate the revenue or the, the money that are necessary to uh, to do either an elective PCR or to manage acute coronary syndrome. I think the, the insurance, the national insurance doesn't cover uh, most of these expensive procedures. But I think we are making progress. If I cast my mind back um, six, seven years ago, I think Ghana has made a lot of progress and a lot of interest um, is being shown in, in this area. So, uh, Dr. Raju, thank you very much for your presentation again and um, for sharing that your, the lights on the uh, antiplatelet therapy, which is really very, very important. And as you mentioned, acute coronary syndrome, anticoagulation, blue antiplatelet therapy is really key. Um, and we have some molecules available and we are happy to hear, you know, the, your brand, which has also been introduced into the country. I would wait, I will pause here for a um, comment from my two colleagues, uh, Professor Inkum and Dr. Ajikum, and then we'll open the floor for comments and for contributions. Francis, uh, Prof. Hello. Hello, Dr. Doku. Hello, uh, thank you for... Yeah, thank yes, you for uh, the opportunity. Okay. Test and then, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to contribute and thanks for the introduction. Thank you, sir. So, I'm happy to hear we can go monotherapy with the CAGRI law. Um, because of cost issues, what will be the cost of the CAGRI law compared to aspirin and clopidogrel? Uh, um, um, I, I am not very sure what is the cost in Ghana, but worldwide, worldwide, uh, the cost of ticagrelor is more uh, compared to clopidogrel. We cannot compare with aspirin because aspirin is out of pocket and it's a molecule which is there for the past 50 years. So it's a different uh, price uh, pricing pattern. But ticagrelor uh, is uh, out of patent. And um, I, I think the price might, will not be too high. Um, but I think compared to Clopidogrel in our country, in India, it is almost uh, double the cost. But I would like to tell you that these molecules, uh, even though they were expensive when it was or not uh, out of patent, but after the patent uh, is as expired, uh, the, the people do not complain of taking these molecules for a longer duration of time. I'm sure African market also, the price might not be too much, um, not too much high, like um, uh, like between uh, uh, clopidogrel and uh, tecaglor might be two, four, double the cost or threefold cost costly. But uh, they are, the, the cost of clopidogrel itself is low, so it should not be too much high. Thank you. What what is the commonest side effect of Tigagri law? The com the, the most common side effect and innocuous one is the uh, non-exertional breathlessness. So if you are not um, the, the little, if you spend a few minutes with the patient, you can reassure the patient. Uh, if otherwise, uh, many a time in the initial part, we get apprehensive and pull out the drug and shift to clopidogrel. Uh, but I, I learned that there's no need for us to stop the molecule. Just reassure them in the next 7 to 10 days, uh, the, the, the breathlessness will dramatically disappear. That's the first point. Having said that, uh, the second uh, important and uh, 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 important and clinically important uh, side effect which we need to remember with Ticagrelor is uh, we need to choose the patient who will benefit and who has got a lesser bleeding risk. So uh, people who have got a less bleeding risk, uh, they can 
tolerate Tikagullar very well. But people who, um, who have got a higher bleeding risk, that means elderly patient, low body weight, uh, renal dysfunction, they have got a higher incidence of complications, um, higher incidence of bleeding complication. Complication is the bleeding. Uh, so we need to identify which patient benefits from Tikagullar by using uh, a proper scoring pattern or clinical characteristics to identify these patients. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Kum and Rahul, for your, your response. Um, what is the cost? Uh, how are you positioning the cost in, um, in Ghana? Uh, in Cha, uh, how are you positioning the um, uh, uh, Good morning, sir. Can you hear me? 60 days in Ghana, that is 90 milligrams twice a, twice a day for one month. How much is the cost to the patient? How are you positioning good, this? Good morning, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, so um, tentatively uh, for 90 milligram BD uh, dosing for a month, the cost of Ticagrelor uh, from MSN would be around 300 CDs or uh, less than 300 CDs. For 90 tablets? <laughs> Yes, please. Oh, yeah. For the 60 tablets. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very 60 much. Tablets, Francis. Sorry. Yeah. Francis. Dr. Jokum. Yeah, Dr. Jokum. So I, I think that is yeah. very good to hear because the Innovator brand is quite expensive. And uh, this is uh, one of the main drugs we are also using in. Uh, our part of the world. I mean, we do a lot of PCIs and we tend to use um, Tecagrelor quite a lot, especially after acute coronary syndrome uh, PCI. So um, it's a drug that is uh, well known. So uh, when it comes to dual antiplatelet therapy, I think the case has been already emphasized, made and emphasized severally here. So that should be fine. Uh, we know they are very important for us to be able to use them. The issue is their affordability, and I'm happy that they are going to reduce the price uh, for us, for our patients to be able to benefit uh, from these medications. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, you very much. Uh, Mohammed, um, interventional cardiologist in Ghana uh, from the International Maritime Hospital. Uh, any comments, your experience with Sita Krelon? Mohammed. <laughs> Mohammed, you are muted if you are trying to speak. Okay. Uh, was waiting for Mohammed. Um, any comments uh, from my other colleagues, um, Dr. The Prince, uh, Dr. Boahini, um, Dr. Tego, Dr. Do, and the other members? Any any questions or comments on the presentation? Yes, so um, I want to ask Rahul, the Supra gel, uh, girl, um, Life how much experience life. do you have with? Because we are using the Innovator mm -hmm. brand, that is the Brillinta, uh, which, as my colleague said, is very yes. expensive. It's very expensive um, for a month's duration. I mean, for even you're giving it for six months, the cost to our patient is a lot. So if you're going to get something that is 300 a month, really that, that would be affordable, uh, you know, by a lot of our patients. But how comparable is it in terms of uh, efficacy and safety? Um, yeah. You know, if you compare that to the Novata branch, um, yeah. Yeah. From X, because you don't want to put in a stent and then you, you, you put in anti playlist that is not effective. And as you know, the complication that will ensue, you know, uh, Stent thrombosis, acute stent thrombosis, or self-acute stent thrombosis, or even in a chronic situation, uh, you could also have 
stent thrombosis coming in. So what's your experience with this um, Morocco from uh, MSN? Yeah. So um, uh, many a time uh, in the initial part, um, uh, the multinational companies, uh, when they uh, when they uh, they little make us feel apprehensive to change on to a generic product. They will say that this molecule is very uh, tough to manufacture. Uh, this will not have the appropriate clinical efficacy and all. Uh, um, I had been using, as I told you, uh, Tecagrelor for about 12 years. And last four, four, four years, uh, the molecule is out of patent and we had been using generics of the Ticagrelor, uh, I can tell you with uh, certainty that uh, the generic Ticagrelor uh, works as efficiently as that of a uh, Brillinter, which is the innovator. That's what they claim to. Um, uh, it, 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 it's my uh, many times uh, uh, when somebody says that it might not work. When we perform an angioplasty, we we keep the patient's safety. Uh, the the, uh, the of paramount importance and i can tell you certainly that the generic ticagrelor works as efficient as that of the innovator okay all right no thank problem. you i mean it's, re it's reassuring to know that yes the efficacy for me is, is comparable i think one antiplatelet is so important i mean in the past you you discharge a patient you give the medication the antiplatelet to the patient on the ward and then you discharge and give prescription. <coughs> and some of them decide, okay, they will buy the antipilates a, a, a few days later or two weeks later, and then they come back with them. So what we've tried to do is that we, if you're going to discharge, you buy it, come and show it to us. We tell you how to use it before you, are, you, are, you, are, you go. Yes. And guess, because um, you educate them, but... The old lady or the old man will give the prescription to the son. Go and buy the drug for me, and then the son decides to buy it a week later. You know, you have a stent there that is not protected. So I think that's one strategy that we view, which has really helped us a lot. You know, to ensure that yes, at least for the critical first one month, you know, you have you have drugs available yes. to cover to, to cover yeah. the. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any other sure, comments? Sure. Uh, is Mohammed able to speak now? Mohammed? Hello, Mohammed. Oh, you are, you are performing an intervention. Okay. Any questions? Any comments? Dr. Alfred, uh, this is Dr. Sashikan from MSN Labs again. Okay. In response to your previous question, sir, uh, we have a bioequivalent study, which our team will be distributing to you. And the, and the study has shown that our molecule, the generic uh, ticagrelor, is bioequivalent to the innovator drug. Okay, So we have a very uh, robust study which has shown that this drug is bioequivalent to the innovator. So we can, you can be assured of its efficacy and safety. That's what I wanted to add, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And I think the evidence to support the, the monotherapy, um, I think it's also very promising. Yes, we have a lot of patients who have GI problems, um, uh, peptic ulcer disease, who really, you know, will not tolerate aspirin in any form, you know, However much you give, you know, uh, protective agents, you know. So I think this really holds some kind of promise to these patients that we struggle with, you know. Um, Ajakuma, you will bear with me. We have these patients, some of them, we have to double the dose of the uh, ticacryl, uh, the, the, yeah, clopidogrel, which is more of an off-label kind of, a, you know. But I think we have evidence for ticacryl or monotherapy. I think that's really very useful information. Yeah. Francis. Yes, Dr. Doku, I remember very well. I mean, now we have, I mean, this 
all this. So this is going to be very useful for us, especially if we have Kekagi Law at an affordable price. I mean, we were forced to do those things because patients, these patients cannot afford Kekagi Law. Uh, you are not sure of the generic clopidogrel you are also getting on the market. And it sometimes becomes difficult. So you then decide to double the dose to achieve something which is very off label. So if we are sure that we are getting a good generic uh, with proven efficacy, then we are good to go. Okay. Thank All you. right. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe back to the panel. Good morning. Morning. Hey, yo. Hi, yo. Mohammed, finally, I yes. can hear your voice. <laughs> I, I was not able to mute myself. I'm sorry. How is the man? It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Look, what, oh, I, yes. I, what I want to add, uh, uh, Tika Grilor is the is uh, my first option in APS, except in small um, conditions. When we use uh, thrombolytic, we should not use ticagrelor at all. This is one thing. Uh, another thing, when you use uh, oral anticoagulant, we cannot use ticagrelor. We use only clopidogrel. This is what I want to uh, press on. This is one thing. Another thing, uh, when you want to shift from uh, clopidogrel to brassogrel or from brassogrel to clopidogrel, it's not, uh, you have to uh, shift properly. You will not give the next dose of of, of prasugrel except after 24 hours from the last tablet of ticagrelor. Yeah, I think Mohammed. Yes, we are doing. Yes. I mean, patient with atrial fibrillation who needs to be on a triple regime. I mean, uh, will be very dangerous to you know. Um, no, don't use yes. Uh, do, do, yeah, do, Doctor Rahul, what's your experience? Um, Triple yeah. therapy. Um, first, first, some for first three months, some first, uh, some first two weeks, or some depending on the indication. Um, what's your What's your triple regime um, for some of these patients with atrial fibrillation? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, the triple regimen uh, patient. The first thing is, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for bringing uh, additional clinical scenarios where. Uh, we should not use ticagrelor. It's very important. Um, young people uh, want to use everything, whereas experienced people know when not to use. So that's the most important thing. When not to use is very important. Now let's come to the triple drug regimen. So how long we should give? Triple drug means aspirin, clopidogrel, and anticoagulant. Either it could be a direct acting oral anticoagulant or a um, uh, or a vitamin K antagonist, uh, the triple drug regimen means only crotidogrel, not prosugrel, not tecagrelor, because the bleeding is very high when you use these agents. That's why you cannot give these two agents when you give the triple drug regimen. So after you, uh, so uh, so the, if for example, patient is on atrial fibrillation and he undergoes a coronary stenting, uh, there are two ways. Uh, I, uh, if it is a acute coronary syndrome, uh, I usually give a triple drug regimen, little extended. And if the patient's bleeding risk is um, is uh, uh, low, then I give for thirty days of uh, aspirin seventy five, clopidogrel seventy five, and uh, the direct oral anticoagulant agent. But after that, we give a combination of clopidogrel plus uh, DOAC for the first one year. So it is not aspirin we give. I give an aspirin-free strategy here when you when I give a triple drug regimen. And when I give uh, DOAC or a vitamin K antagonist, never take a color, never prosugrel. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. You still use uh, uh, the metallic stains because of some bleeding risk so that you will shorten the, the period of anti, anti, low anti therapy. therapy. Uh, what, what's, what's, what's your take on this? You still do that? With the advent of new generation drug eluting stent, um, we rarely use a bare metal. I, 
I don't think I have used a bare metal. I don't think we have bare metal stent in the cat lab also. So it's a uh, it's a bare drug eluting stent and a new generation stent. And if I want to, let's say, a patient requires surgery, uh, then uh, we can use for uh, three months and send them for surgery, a stent, and then send for surgery. Or sometimes I avoid a stenting also by doing a. Uh, balloon angioplasty and send them for surgery or a thrombo aspiration and send them for surgery. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, over to the panel. And, and I have another question, Dr. Duke. Yes. Okay. Uh, please, sir, uh, uh, you, just was, you were just talking about uh, glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors. Uh, yeah. uh, many patients, and when I'm working, when especially when they are coming late, and when I'm starting with the ticagrelor and the noriflor will occur, the bleeding is too much when I'm using tyrofepan. Yes. So what can so, be done um, when I have noriflor? Yeah. So usually for noriflor, uh, previously I used to use a glycoprotein two B three A blocker. Uh, but nowadays, I stop using it. So the best way to treat a no reflow is uh, the procedural protocol. So avoid a post dilatation, avoid a pre dilatation. This is the first uh, procedural uh, uh, tips to uh, avoid a no reflow. So post dilatation is the most common reason for a no reflow phenomenon. So uh, the the my philosophy. <clears throat> of stenting such patients would be uh, take a little a quarter size larger stent deploy at a low pressure that means about 12 atmosphere or uh, something like that because I don't go to 18s and 16s, 18s and 20s in acute coronary take if the vessel is 3 millimeter or 3.25 take a 3.5 millimeter stent and deploy at 12 atmosphere my philosophy is that you exclude the uh, atherosclerotic plaque rupture or plaque erosion, whatever might be the pathology, you exclude it from the lumen of the vessel. So that's the first uh, thing what I do to prevent a no reflow. Then if the no reflow happens, with that I avoid a lot of no reflows, uh, very rare. But if the no reflow happens, I use um, uh, the, like uh, any uh, one of us like uh, a nitroglycerin then I use uh, necorandil, a 2 milligram uh, vial you have, and then we can give intracoronary. I'm not sure whether it is available in uh, Ghana. Uh, the third thing is if nitrogen, then the third thing is I use adenosine. So nitroglycerin, necorandil, adenosine. If these three do not work, I use uh, sodium nitroprusside. So all of them, uh, uh, the, except for necorandil, the uh, uh, the dilution is the same. Uh, we give about 60 to 120 micrograms, uh, just like adenosine, uh, like you dilute three times, then it works well. So these are the three, uh, four agents what I use. Nitroglycerin, necorandil, adenosine, and sodium nitroprusside in this order. Mm -hmm. Then, mm -hmm. for example, one more scenario is, if, for example, let's say I need to give a 2B3A blocker, uh, for those setting, then I don't give the full dose of the agent. I give mm -hmm. only a 10 milligram, uh, sorry, 10 ml of the injection instead of giving the full 100 ml. And then mm -hmm. I realize that the pharmaceutical industry is also supporting this with 10, m 10 ml vials in India. So we use only 10 ml instead of the full 100 ml. So these are the various procedural and pharmacological uh, steps I do in this scenario. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, no, no reflow. I mean, is a is a nightmare, especially in ACS. Uh, Rahum and um, uh, Mohammed, thank you for bringing it up. Um, I think that your some of these strategies. Yeah, we also employ make sure that yeah, you don't pre dilate and also uh, post dilatation. Also, we try to avoid them, especially in the ACS um, um, scenario. Um, okay. But the MSN, you have this IV um, antiplatelet system, uh, the fire band and the others in Ghana or in I don't, India. They, they, they have 
they they man they have cangrelor in india uh, they okay. have intravenous cangrelor for patients who are on cardiogenic shock who are ventilated and all that they have a intravenous uh, antiplatelet that is cangrelor it works faster and uh, for those patients who cannot take the oral pill it's a good good alternative okay all right thank you so please you. ship some of these agents to us they 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 may be life saving yes. especially when you have high uh, uh, no clot load <laughs> yeah you, you it may be very helpful all right thank you all right back thank to you, you. um are the yes sir if there are no more questions uh, we will uh, we will stop yeah. the proceeding sir yeah yeah let me let me go around again to find a dr tego dr do um francis uh, mohammed any more questions or prof prof do you have any more questions or comments I just uh, 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 Dr. Duke I was just want another question please. Yes, go ahead Mohammed. Please sir uh, when the patient is already on clopidogrel and they want to shift on pras on ticagrelor I have to wait 24 hours? Uh, no, I I I don't stop. Uh, I don't wait for that time. So usually if the patient is already on ticagrelor as a acute myocardial infarction I give if I want to give a loading, I give them the full dose. Okay, and the opposite, if the patient is bleeding from ticagrelor, and I will shift to clopidogrel. Yes. So if this is a scenario which I, which I used to uh, de-escalate them onto clopidogrel some time ago. So I used to sometimes uh, pull when I want to pull them off from ticagrelor. I used to reload them with clopidogrel. But nowadays, the guidelines clearly say that there is no need for reloading with clopidogrel. You can just shift them from 90 milligram twice daily to 75 milligram once a day of clopidogrel. That is what I have been using for past four five years. No complications. So I don't reload. So I, just I can directly shift from ticagrelor to clopidogrel directly. Thank you so much. Okay, so you can take over. Uh, I don't think. Um, I've gone around. Uh, I don't think we have any more comments from Ghana. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Alfred and Mohammed and other team members for having a very nice interactive discussion. I think I will ask MSN to <laughs> conduct so more even so that we have a lot of exchange of uh, practice patterns so we learn from each other. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Alfred and uh, other uh, doctors for uh, participation participating in this and actively asking your questions and making it a more interactive and learning session. Thank you very much. And I would, we would also like to thank Dr. Raghu for his excellent presentation and his knowledge sharing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. You. Thank you, doctors. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Recording stopped. Simply disconnect. Thank you. Support. Okay.